Hello everyone, I'm Sebastian Y, and this is Managerial Economics. In this set of videos, I'm going to introduce the field of industrial organization and the structure conduct performance paradigm. In this video, I'm going to give an overview and then start talking about structure. Industrial organization is a field within economics that is all about the study of markets and the firms that inhabit them. We compare different market structures and see how firms behave differently across those different market structures. This is highly relevant to managerial economics because managers need to understand how to react to those different situations that they might find themselves in. We will frame our discussion using what is known as the Structure Conduct Performance Paradigm, or SCP. The idea behind SCP is to start with the underlying structure of the market, see how that leads to conduct of firms within that market, and then ultimately how both of those things lead to the performance of the market. We're going to start with structure. When we think about the structure of a market or an industry, there are a few things that we want to consider. The number of firms in the market and the relative size of those firms, the technology used by those firms and how that leads to cost structures for those firms, the characteristics of the demand function, and finally, the barriers to entry or lack thereof. First, let's talk a little bit about firm size. The most basic consideration here is whether firms in the market tend to be large or small. But beyond that, we want to know how large firms and small firms behave differently while operating in the same market. For example, consider innovation. Do small firms tend to innovate or do large firms tend to innovate? This might differ by the particular industry we're looking at. It might be that the large firms tend to drive innovation because they have the resources to do so. But on the other hand, it might be the small firms who drive innovation because they need to innovate in order to survive and then hopefully eventually become the large firms. Finally, we might be interested in how the large firms in a market got to be large. Our next consideration of market structure is concentration. We say that a market is highly concentrated if it is dominated by a small number of large firms and we say that it is not very concentrated if the market share is spread out among many smaller firms. Perfectly competitive markets are the least concentrated type of market, while monopolies are the most concentrated type of market. In real life, most industries lie somewhere in between those two extremes. We're going to consider two different ways to measure concentration in a market. We'll start with the concentration ratio. The concentration ratio measures the total market share produced by the n largest firms. We denote concentration ratio as CRN. To calculate the concentration ratio, we add up the market shares of the n largest firms in the market. So for example, the CR1 would be just the market share of the largest firm, CR2 would be the sum of the largest and second largest, and so on. One of the most commonly used concentration ratios is the four firm concentration ratio, or the CR4. This is going to be the sum of the top four market shares in the market. Before we calculate the concentration ratio, we first need to calculate market shares. We will denote the market share of firm I as WI. I just represents a generic firm in the market. It could be firm one, firm two, firm three, and so on. We define WI as QI divided by big Q. QI is the individual firm's output, and the big Q is the total amount of output in the market. So the market share is the fraction of the total output that that particular firm produces. Then to calculate the CRN, we're going to add up the market share for the largest firm, call that W1, plus the second largest firm, plus the third largest firm, and so on, until we've added up n market shares. For the CR4, it's just going to be W1 plus W2 plus W3 plus W4. Supposing that there are big N firms in the market, if we happen to pick a CR for an N that is greater than or equal to big N, then the CR is just going to be one because we've added up every single firm in the market. Note that because of the way we calculate it, the CR can never be more than one. 
meaning that 100% of the market is controlled by the top N firms. The second common measure of concentration is the herfindahl hirschman index. also known as the HHI. We define the HHI as the sum of the squared market shares, and then we often multiply that by 10,000. Unlike the concentration ratio where we choose N, there is only one HHI. We always use all of the firms in the market when calculating the HHI. Using our definition of market share from before, the HHI is equal to W1 squared plus W2 squared and so on up until we add up the final market share, which remember big N from before is the number of firms in the market. We square all of those and then we multiply that by 10,000. You might see some measures of HHI that omit the 10,000. That's fine. We're going to use the 10,000 here because the mergers guidelines from the Department of Justice use this version. Note that because of the squaring, large market shares are gonna have a huge impact on the HHI. So for example, if you had one firm with a market share of 0.1 and another firm with a market share of 0.2, to calculate those two firms' contribution to the HHI, we would square them and add them up, which would give us 0 0.01 plus 0 0.04, which would be 0 0.05, which would, we would then multiply by 10,000. If these two firms were to merge, then the 0 0.1 plus the 0 0.2 would then sit under the parentheses before we square. That's going to be 0 0.3 squared, which is going to be 0 0.09. So you can see that when two firms merge, that's going to drive up the HHI. It's going to increase concentration of the market. The highest possible HHI is when we have a monopoly, in that case, it would just be one market share of one. One squared times 10,000 is 10,000. So 10,000 is the highest HHI that we could possibly get. Let's look at an example of calculating concentration ratio and HHI. Here I have an Excel sheet that shows the market share of the top 10 firms in the U.S. auto industry. First, let's go ahead and calculate the CR4. Remember that the CR4 is the sum of the top four market shares. I've already put these in order of size, so I'm just going to take GM, Ford, Toyota, and Fiat Chrysler and add those up. So the CR4 in this industry is 0.581, meaning that approximately 58% of the market is controlled by the top four firms. We could also calculate other concentration ratios. So for example, we could calculate the CR5 by taking the sum of the top five, and so on. That's going to be 0.68, meaning 68% of the market is controlled by the top five firms. Now let's go ahead and calculate the HHI. Remember that with the HHI, we need to square and sum all of the market shares in the market. First thing I want to point out here is that in this data set, we do not have every single firm in the market. In fact, if we were to add up all of the market shares that we have here, we only get about 95%, meaning that about 5% of the market we have not accounted for. When calculating the HHI, sometimes we have to leave the smallest ones off if we just don't have the data. In general, this is not too big of a deal because those are really small numbers, and when you square them, they're going to be even smaller and will have a very minimal impact on the HHI. To calculate the HHI, I'm going to calculate a column where I square the market share. So I'm going to take this to the power of 2, and then copy that all the way down. And then I'm going to take the sum of all of those, and then multiply by 10,000. That gives me an HHI of 1,138. Remember that with a monopoly, our HHI is 10,000, so this is not particularly close to that, but it is still a relatively big HHI. The auto industry is fairly concentrated, but it's certainly quite far from a monopoly. Remember, though, that this HHI that we just calculated is a little bit low because we've left off about 5% of the market. 
the real HHI is a little bit higher. If I take 1 minus the total market share that we have so far, we get 5.2% for what we might call the others in the market. What we don't want to do in calculating the HHI is to square that other category and then add that on too. The reason for that is that we would then be assuming that that 5.2% is controlled by a single firm, which we know it's not. It's controlled by lots of small firms that are less than 2.2%, which is Daimler's market share here. If we were to square that, multiply by 10,000 and add that to the HHI that we had, we can see that we get an HHI that is quite a bit higher, and this is definitely wrong. And so when we have a bunch of firms that we haven't accounted for, we're going to just leave those off from the HHI calculation, and we're going to go with this number instead. The last thing I want to mention about both concentration ratio and HHI is that we calculate the market shares by firm and not individual product. So if a firm has multiple products in the same industry, we need to add all of those up. So notice that we have in our market share here, the market share for Toyota as a whole, not for Camry, Corolla, and all the other cars that they make separately. We have to add those up first, which is really important when calculating the HHI because we need to collect them all under the parentheses before we take the square. The next component of structure to talk about is technology. You might remember that in economics, when we use the word technology, we're talking about the method from which inputs are turned into outputs. Previously in the course, we've represented technology for a firm using the production function. That will still be the case. Remember that that production function then leads us to a firm's cost function, which is very important in thinking about how they behave within a market. Some characteristics to consider would include if the production function is labor intensive or capital intensive, and whether it exhibits economies of scale or diseconomies of scale. If there's major economies of scale, this is gonna to lead to larger firms, whereas diseconomies is gonna to lead to a less concentrated market with smaller firms. Within an industry, you might also have some firms who have access to more efficient technology than others, and that might lead them to dominate the market. Next, we're gonna think about demand. We talked about where demand comes from earlier on in the course, and all those things still apply. Some considerations here might be whether the market has a high demand or a low demand. Of course, that's going to have a big influence on how profitable that market can be. We might also want to know how easy it is for consumers to shop around for prices. This is something we call search cost in economics. When there's high search cost, it's hard to find the best deal, which might be helpful for firms as they are going to get away with charging higher prices. But if it's low cost to shop around, then firms are going to end up being more competitive on price. Elasticity is also important. Goods with many available substitutes have an elastic demand because if the price goes up, they can easily switch to an alternative. In that situation, firms are not going to be able to price as highly, but if there are not very many available substitutes, then firms can get away with charging a higher price. Finally, we're going to look at the potential for entry into a market. This is one of the most important things to think about as we move forward, because this is going to have a huge influence on the structure of the market. Barriers to entry are obstacles that raise the opportunity cost for entering an industry. So let's talk about some examples. Large capital requirements can be a barrier to entry. Industries that require a large amount of equipment to get started, like the auto industry, are quite difficult to enter. Patents are a legal barrier to entry. In the United States, a utility patent prevents competitors from utilizing a particular innovation for a period of 20 years. This can make a firm a monopoly for a period of time. This is particularly important in the pharmaceutical industry where we see patent races. Different competing firms try to be the first to patent a drug and therefore get that monopoly. Economies of scale are also an important barrier to entry. An industry that has huge economies of scale means that a firm that is producing a large amount of output has lower average costs. This makes it hard to enter a market because a new firm is not going to be able to scale up production to the level of the existing firms, and that might drive them out of the market. We might even see economies of scale so extreme that only a monopoly can even be profitable in the market. That's what we call a natural monopoly.
This has been a quick overview of the structure part of SCP. In the next video, we'll head on to conduct.